thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Verse 2. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faith. faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed I and have provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me key change verse 3 Oh, pardon our sin and the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Train for today and bright, oh, for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. For morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, I had hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is faithfulness. Morning by morning. New mercies I see. All I have need in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is our faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I can't tell you how much joy it is to play this guitar again. It really is. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, Kindly will help me. He always loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. 
I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, calm, passionate friend. I'm, if I but ask him, he will deliver and make of my troubles quickly and in. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my my burdens alone I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Jesus can help Oh, my Jesus alone. Verse 3, trampled and tried I. I need a great Savior like Jesus. One who can help my, my burden to bear. I must tell Jesus. Oh, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and, and my sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my, my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Chorus, one more time. I must tell Jesus, oh, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, my Jesus alone. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Jesus can help me, my Jesus. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Pastor. Hearing myself. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we... 
tons of substitutes going on. We're trying to figure everything out this morning. We've got to. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of ushers be great. So, Father, we thank you for your, your faithfulness. In you we find our security. In you we find our safety. In you we find our peace that passes understanding. We ask you now, Lord, Father, to bless the tithe and the offering, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we ask you to bless each family, Lord, Father, uh, and provide for each need. We are grateful for your provision and that you are our source. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. You got me. If you didn't think Bill Gates was in cahoots with the Antichrist, you do after all. No, just he's. Uh, oh, actually, there's. I mean, let's just say. Uh, I'm not sure Bill Gates is redeemed. I'm pretty sure he's not. So uh, if you're not working for the king, you're definitely working against him. That's tough for us to kind of digest. Uh, before we get in into continuation of our, nest, uh, our deal, we'll buy some time. Uh, but I, we've got our old backup projector, throwback. So we've gone back four or five years. We kept that hooked up just in case something like this happened. Um, Continue to be praying for um, Steve, uh, or we know him as uh, Les Stevenson. Uh, we've had it. I'm sitting back, and I, I was kind of whining in my prayer walk with the Lord about how many people we've had to let go of. And uh, it's been we've had to let go of a lot of people. And I was kind of whining at the Lord, and he just... He gave me a mental picture. I don't know if it's worth anything to you guys, but it was worth a lot to me. He said, no farmer grows grows a crop without the expectation of a harvest. And if you ever lived in western Kansas, you know that there's a race sometimes to get the harvest in before the storm comes and it's lost. And so it's, it's just kind of sweet sorrow. We may be seeing more of these kinds of things uh, yet, but... Alice is with the Lord. And but that leaves us and leaves leaves less. And it's hard. Um and then we've got Sharon, who last week we buried John. And uh Sharon was in, in, in the hospital and got out the day when when day was it the day of the funeral or the day before? Uh, and then she's back in rehab, and she's about to come out of rehab, and and, and there's got to have to be a lot of life change for her. And uh, when you've been had to let go of something that was the most treasured in your life as a spouse, and then all of a sudden, now you're going to have to face letting go of a lot of other stuff. I, I I'm only saying this to you because it's important. If we're not careful, churches begin to look like organizations and begin to look like uh, corporations and we run like a business and not a family and so one of the things that that, that I want to caution us about and by the way this I don't think this is getting recorded or anything right now I don't know we we couldn't get all that uh, anyway so you got what I'm saying is try to remember what you can um, this COVID thing has done an awful lot separate the believers uh, and, and I don't want to get in into any of the politics but I will get into the, the biblical pattern uh, I just want to encourage you to watch how Jesus treated the lepers back I've said this before back when AIDS broke out that's how old I am I had to I had to Ask God to develop a theology, a pattern for me to, to deal with. At that time, they thought nobody could touch. Remember how bad that was back then? 
And, and I couldn't help but think when this all started, that we'd been here many times before. And so, you know, we, 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 what we have to do is follow Jesus through. And uh, just listen to what he has to say. And so, what we do need to do is never forget our purpose. If we forget our purpose, then there's no point. Our purpose is to prepare a people for the return of the Lord. That we believe could happen imminently in any moment. They come in those clouds. And so I just want to caution us as, as, as we may face more, especially our congregation is a lot of it's aging out. And it's hard for, hard for me as a pastor because uh, we love. What I'm saying is, <laughs> sounds like an old rock and roll sound, song, but love hurts. And so we need to make sure we're loving one another and not isolating from one another in order not to be hurt. And so in that, you need to, to, one of the ways that you learn to love people is you pray for them. One of the things I shared at John's Celebration of Life deal is, and Al and I were talking a little bit about it, and I'm just talking this morning. We'll get into this here in a moment. We're going to pray for him. But you all remember John just used to come to Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas or all the, the little dinners and stuff. And that's when we'd see him. And then Sharon's stroke happened, and he started driving Sharon. And he used to sit out in the parking lot. And then he started coming in with her. And then John had his massive heart stroke, uh, his massive heart attack in 2019. Many of us forget that. But if you, you know, there was a marked change in John. And for the last 13, 14 months, he sat right there behind me. Now I will tell you that he used to come in, he didn't say anything to anybody, he just went to his seat. And he'll tell you that, and that that evolved to where it was a smile, and he intentionally engaged us. And we talked to you. And then some of his his family didn't get to know him that way. And you know, as oftentimes people reach out, well, is he is he in heaven? Is with the Lord? And and I can, and I'm almost segue into the sermon this morning. I can tell you, yeah, because his character changed. You want to know somebody saved? Look at their character. It'll change. No character changed, and there's no Christ present. Because when we come, become born again, what happens is we are being transformed into His image, and that we are beginning of His character surplant our old man who's supposed to die, our old character. And we become Christ-like. And that's what Christians meant, is that we begin to behave and live as Christ does. I'm glad to have my brother-in-law Mike here. I throw him under the bus so much now, put him in the front seat a little bit, let him ride comfortably. Uh, i got to tell you, Mike, i to say it publicly now, I was struggling with the possibility of losing you in the midst of all of this. And it, I'm not getting soft towards you, brother-in-law. I just, just don't know that. But I just say that as much as every day we have a gift with one another, and we need to, we need to, it, it, I've said it before, if I knew the week before when I saw Alice that it would be the last time, it probably would have been different. And then Elaine Beatty just passed away, and I saw her a couple of weeks before, because uh, they, they live in Halstead, and so they this is their church, and they only come three or four times a year, they, but they drive from Halstead to come here, try to get them to go somewhere else. But, but I just saw her, and if I'd have known it was the last time I'd see her, I would have said something else. And so we don't know. We ha all I'm doing is trying to stress to you, there's a lot of bad negative habits that we can take out of this experience. And those are not the things God wants to pack in our hearts what he wants to pack in our hearts is, is that whenever there's a crisis, your priorities ought to be purified. And you begin to understand what's important. And I, uh, you may be getting too certain this morning. And so let's pray. And, and uh, then we've got a lot. You know the Ramses, the Ruthers, 
Carol Cash and his family. I mean, there are a lot of them that are that are out, a ton of them that are out right now. And and in the case of Carol Cash, his wife, his breathing system is uh, so compromised that he he's really really worried about ever taking. And he just called me up and said, Pastor, I'm not going to come back until uh, until February. And as you know, we've suspended. Sunday school, as most Sunday school class <laughs> is at home, and that'll be picking up again in February. I'm going to tell you what. The devil wants to divide us. He wants to separate us. He doesn't care for what reason. He doesn't care why. He doesn't even care how you feel about it, as long as he can separate you from the body of Christ. Amen. Lord, we just lift up Sharon right now, who's laying heavy on our hearts right now, Lord, Father. Help us, Lord, Father, to know exactly how to love her, how to walk with her, and how to even provision her, Lord, Father, through this transition through her time, through her life. Let us not forget less, Lord, Father. Let he be heavy on our hearts as well, Lord, Father. And, Father, those that, the ton, the multitude right now, uh, who are normally just watching from their phones, and, uh, and, and, we're unable to even give them that this morning, but I, I just ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, Father, to descend upon where they are, and I know they'll open up their Bibles, they'll do a devotion, they'll read, uh, they'll, they'll turn on their TV, they'll, they'll find food this morning. And Father, I ask for your anointing and blessing to be upon them. Father, we ask you to guide us through the storm of this time, Lord, so that we don't get off course or shipwrecked in our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're, we've been talking in the last couple of weeks about six transformations to follow uh, in the life of a believer. <clears throat> and we're, we're, we're at the second one. Uh, we're talking about trans, uh, transformation of the character in the life of a believer. The, we spend a lot of time talking about the transformation of your mind. When you come to Christ, you have to, your mind has to be transformed. And what we focused on about your mind being transformed is how you process your world and what your priorities and values are. They change. If you never change your priorities and values, if you, if you never change your thinking, then your character will never be transformed. Now, your character is not transformed by your thinking. Your thinking is your cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Are you guys tracking with me this morning? And so your character is not something you can manifest in your flesh or cause to happen in your flesh. Your character is transformed by the presence of Christ and by the sanctifying, edifying, building up work of the Holy Spirit in your life day by day by day. Unfortunately, salvation is often taught or at least perceived and understood as an event rather than a journey or a lifestyle. We're constantly being renewed in our mind. Does that know what scripture tells us? It, uh, do we not constantly die to self all the time? And so one of the problems, and, you, and let me just stop here and push the pause button. Why this is so important to me is I really believe we are living in the last days. And one of the hallmarks of the last days is a great falling away. And when you fall away from something, that means you no longer, it no longer has the value uh, for you in your life. It's not as important anymore. It, 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 listen, would you agree with me? Salvation is indispensable. But often we live life as though it's not indispensable. And so one of the things that happens that we're warned about is the great falling away. And I believe what contributes to the great falling away is the thing that Jesus warned us about, false teachers and false prophets and false Christ. Now, we're unpacking that on Wednesday nights, okay? If you want to come to the Wednesday night uh, biblical prophecy teaching stuff. By the way, if you don't want to come on Wednesday for the next two nights, you can go over to, uh, oh gosh, Hope Church. They have a little uh, small group of about uh, 14, and they asked me to come over and share some stuff. So if you, want, if, you don't want to, if you miss Wednesday nights and you want to come over, you can come over and catch that. They're, they have an active Bible prophecy group. Uh, and I was free, and so they, they asked me to come. 
So, and I'm sharing with them a little bit of the stuff that I know that we, we teach on Wednesday nights. So just, just putting a peg in for that, if you want to go over, that's a good group, small group that you can, you can become involved with. And if you're wondering what church that was, that used to be Believer's Tabernacle. Uh, that's on um, Hillside and Mount Vernon, okay? But now it's Hope Church, okay? Pastor Bobby Massey uh, and those guys over there. So um, just throw that in there. But what we've got is these three main factors going on that, that, I, that contribute to, to it. We've we got an apostate church in the current culture. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that and agree with me. What an apostate church is, in its simplest terms and definition, and it's a lot more than what I'm about to say, but it's those who have left the original teachings. Okay, and that we're going to segue in here. Because what transforms, uh, what changes and transforms our character is the Word of God and how you process it and understand it. We know the Word of God is live and active. In other words, the Word of God will do something. And this is dangerous. Because once the word of God, you have heard it, you process it, begin to understand it, you're now accountable. And the word of God always brings you to a place of decision. You will either accept it and reject it. If you accept it, then you are transformed by it. If you reject it, you now be conformed by a whole different set of values. We call it the world system. Okay? And so the great falling away is the deception of false, false teaching and, and false prophets. What's a false teacher? A false teacher in its simplest terms is someone who takes the word of God or takes what scripture says or what God has demonstrated and gives it a false meaning. One that's not true or accurate. It could be just slightly twisted off. I use the illustration to with you guys many, many times that if I spit in this bottle of water, how many of you really want to drink it right now? It's contaminated. Okay? And I would simply say to you, why would you not drink it? It is 99% pure, right? Look, if we calculate, it might my spit might even be less than that, proportional in here than that. But Jesus said this, that a little leaven, what? Leaven the whole lump. And so when we, if we're not careful, and by the way, you're responsible before God. You can't get, the, when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you can't blame me for bad teaching. God will deal with me severely. Leaders are dealt with severely when they do false teaching. But to try to cut to the chase so you're not here all day and everybody said amen. False teaching, I think, more than anything else in the current church. By the way, the devil loves to work in the church. Okay? Because if he can work in the church, then, then, then the world has no light. Okay? But with false teaching, what happens is the development of a false security. It makes sense, you guys? And so there becomes a false security. And by the way, we don't have time to go into it, but when you look at the seven letters in Revelation, that's what Jesus is dealing with, false security, isn't he? Those are churches. Those are believers. And they've allowed their culture, their preferences, their lifestyle, all that kind of stuff to, to weed in. And Jesus, some of them are lukewarm, some of them think they're good by their wealth, but they're really sick and need to, I mean, we can go through it. And interesting, the, the two, if my memory serves me correct, that he approves of are the ones that by our standard we would say are miserable failures. There are patterns and cycles in Scripture, and they're there so that we can understand how God works. In our lives. And we can discern whether it's God or not. We can say this is that. Or that is not this. And so this false teaching is when you take. And I'm going to throw a guy under the bus. Too bad if you don't like it. I mean I used to read him. Used to like him. But Andy Stanley. I name him. Andy Stanley came out and said the Old Testament is not relevant. A couple of years ago. I should simply say that without an Old Testament. The New Testament has no legitimacy. 
In fact, the New Testament is the fulfillment of parts of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not fully fulfilled yet. So therefore, it's relevant. And I want to get into all that. By the way, your theology informs your eschatology. Theology is what you know and understand about God. Eschatology is about, it means what you're about to believe will take place and happen. Your eschatology then informs your future conduct. It's as simple as this, okay? If you believe the Lord could return at any moment, and we do believe in the imminent return of the Lord, then you live in the light, what I call the light of the rapture, knowing that any moment that he could be here. And I need to be ready for the unexpected. Isn't that what he taught? He'll come like a thief at night in the hour you least expect. But think about false teaching. False teaching, uh, we could go deep, deep into that. We could go into predestination, predetermination, which is a great deep deception, okay? You can get all into all of these kinds of things, but that's what false teaching does, and it's on a larger, brander scale. Then you got false prophets. What's a prophet's job? A prophet's job and calling, first and primary, is to come from God with a word to the people. We, so who do you trust? Do something scary. Go, go, go to YouTube and put in prophets. Start listening to some of the stuff they say. If I don't know the word of God, you're going to hear everything. God's an alien. I mean, everything. They'll take scripture and they'll mush it and mush it. And, uh, by the way, you're personally responsible for your understanding and interpretation of scripture. When you, like I said before, when you stand before God and say, well, I believe this. He said, why do you believe that? Well, Rick said that. Well, that would get you in trouble. Anyway, if you want to know what my job is, my job is to take the lid off the can, not to feed you, force feed you, but to make it available to you. Somebody say, get on with it. I'm still the introduction. I haven't got very far. And then the other thing that, that we look at is the false prophet. And what we've got is tons and tons of people who are saying this about God, that about God, this about God, that about God, that God said this, God said that. And then they start contradicting each other if you're tracking and watching any of this. So the tendency for us then to say is that God is not speaking. God is still speaking, but you've got to do your homework. First of all, you've got to make sure that whatever they say lines up with Scripture. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to look for the character of Christ. Is the character of Christ there? And when you look at the character of Christ, then motives are going to be explained. Don't get mad at me, but would, would, would they still do their ministry if they couldn't sell the podcast, if they couldn't sell the conference, if they couldn't do any of that kind of stuff, if now they had to live on minimum wage, would they still do it? There are some that will, and those are the ones I listen to. So you have false prophets, and then you got false Christ. Now, we tend to look at the false Christ as the crazy ones we can see like the Jim Joneses. Anyway, that's another thing I got going on that we'll get into Wednesday night. And, and we, we check it every year. We see how many more. Yes, there are a lot more than there was. And they're getting a lot crazier. But those are not the ones that are so dangerous to us. The false Christ are the, the false Christ that's being presented to us. Remember what Paul said? If an angel or a person or anybody else preach any Christ other than the one I preach. They're preaching a false Christ. So the, the false Christ that we have now is the one that's being depicted and portrayed before us that basically becomes an insurance policy. And yet when you read what Jesus said to follow Christ was to pick up a cross. In fact, listen, this is tough. One of the things that Jesus was adamant about was making sure that those who chose to follow him knew what they were going to get into and that it would be hard on the flesh. I was praying the other day, and this is not something that happens all the time, but, but when, when you think, <laughs> well, I do pray all the time. I now figure out what that sounded like as it played back in my head. But the anointing, this is the thing that the anointing doesn't always manifest this way. But do you realize if you take a look at Scripture 
and you take a look at how the anointing, and what the anointing is, is the divine supernatural uh, uh, presence and provision of God being made in your life. It's what miracles are made out of. I mean, we can go from the Old Testament Shekinah glory to the pillar of fire, all that stuff, to laying on hands on the sick or speaking in tongues, all that stuff, okay? All that, that comes from the anointing. When God picks a thing out and he says it's going to be used for this express purpose, and as it, long as it's used for that purpose, then my I will enable and empower it to accomplish the task. Everybody clear on what anointing is? Now here's what I, what, what I think we miss. That the anointing overwhelmingly in Scripture is, all, is more present overwhelmingly in the midst of pain and misery and heartache. Now, there are moments where the, the anointing falls in worship services, in times of worship, in personal devotions, and personal praise and worship. But by and far, the impactful, the impactful anointing comes when we are hurting the most. When misery. Now, the only reason I mention that is because we only want one kind of anointing. We want God only to throw a party. We don't want him present to put the world back together for us. Because we don't want the world to fall, to fall apart. And let me just throw this in as, a, as, as also a side note. What oftentimes gets in the way of anointing is bitterness, despondency, anger and creates a rift with God I was I, I, I kind of reminded a little bit with little one and she fell down the chair hit her and I went over to help her and she did not want me to touch her because she's in the middle of pain but she did go to her mom what do we what do I learn from that well oftentimes what I learned from that is she's intimate with her mom. And so in pain, she'll go to her. Listen to me. She wasn't intimate with me. She, she smiles at me, says, hi, Pastor Rick. But I'm not the one she's going to jump in the lap of and hug the neck on uh, like she does uh, the rest of her family. She just tolerates me right now. Okay? But that sometimes that's the same way we approach God. Well, he's... He's kind of important around here. I can tell that. She can tell that. He has a title, Pastor, but how much does she know about Pastor Rick? Well, I fixed her toy today. Huh? Well, wait, think about how simple this is. I took time out right before the service, got a screwdriver, found some batteries, and fixed a toy for her. So what happens? That created an interaction, didn't it? <coughs> See, and that, by the way, that's simple for us. That's exactly how we experience God, most of us. You know, you want to get beyond that, right? That we're, we're, you show up for the party and you show up for the pain. What we need is the constant acknowledgement of the presence of God in our lives. Let me move on. Man, that was, I, this is, I ain't even gotten to the notes. Okay. Transforming the character. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, we find this. And this is the temptation of Jesus. But I want to, he says something here that we don't often process deep enough. I think we understand it, and I think it becomes utilitarian to us, but I don't think we quite grasp it at his depth. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4 in the ESV version. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Let that sink in. It's the will of God for you to face the devil from time to time and to overcome him. By the way, if you're following Jesus, you will be following where the Spirit leads. Right? Aren't we supposed to be Spirit-led people? I preached a sermon a long, long time ago. Uh, quit ducking the fights the Spirit picks for you. We often do. Uh... Verse 2 goes on and says, And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. 
what, what I, I'm going to, he was simultaneously at his spiritual best and his physical weakness. Let that sink in. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He's out in the wilderness. He's been praying, dedicating himself to hearing God, understanding God, processing God, being tempted by the devil as well. Or, or at, then the devil comes at the end here. And all of this preparation takes place. By the way, let me just say this. You need to be prepared because the devil's going to eventually come. The problem with most of us is we don't prepare until he gets to the door. Right? I'm going to give you an ugly mental picture, okay? But, uh, but it illustrates a point. Uh, when I was a young pastor, every once in a while I would have these, single pastor, I'd have these dreams that somebody would come knock on my front door and I was in my underwear in the front room and couldn't find my clothes, so I couldn't answer the door. And I'm freaking out, stressing out. Because I'm in the ministry. There's somebody on the front door knocking. I need to go help them, but I can't find my clothes. And I had this thing about three or four times, and then I just finally said, Lord, what? I don't want to dream this no more. What's this mean? What are you trying to tell me through this? He says, you're not prepared. There were times in there I'd go look in the wash machine, and all I could ever find was dirty, stinky clothes over here. Well, what is that? What's he telling me? He says, you got you to practice. you got to let the Holy Spirit practice personal sanctification on you. you got to you have a prayer life. got to have a worship life. got to have a devotional life. you got to have a service life. Outside of this as well. you you got to serve me outside of what you call the ministry. Maybe just putting a little toy back together and putting batteries in it. And so what we have to understand is, is that after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, there, I won't go into he's hungry. He has, he has a physical need, okay? And so for me, he's, it, he's got the best, the most important thing is set. And the secondary thing is where he's, he's weak right now. He's hungry. Look, man, it's almost, it's, it's noon now. I'm sorry, we're into overtime. Uh and some of you are hungry now. How many get hangry? Yeah, I, I hear you. By the way, there are physical things that happen to your body during a fast. And so, and he, he was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the son of man at this time, revealing himself as the son of God halfway through his ministry. He's all of that all of the time, but he's dealing, being, he's dealing with the same things we got to deal with so he can identify with us later as the high priest, right? So we need to remember that as well as our characters being, trans, being transformed and being more like Christ. The same thing that the Spirit used to transform Christ, he will use to transform you. No, you need to hear that one more time. If you want to know how you're going to be changed into the likeness and reflect the image of Christ, the Holy Spirit will use the same process he used with Christ, he will use on you. Because he's the first fruit. And you're the follower. He picked up a cross. He tells you to do what? Pick up a cross and follow after me. And so oftentimes, we're not allowing our character to be changed because we don't want it to happen the way it happened with Jesus. The next thing that we see here in verse 3, And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, we won't get into this deeper, but here's the first thing that happens. His first attempt is, not, is he challenges his identity. If you say you are who you say you are. If you are who you think you are. How many have gone through that? Just me. Someday you will be there too. I go through it periodically. The tempter comes. Listen, by the way, he'll stop for a while when it don't work. But then he'll wait for an opportune time where he thinks he's gotten you softened up and he'll challenge your identity again. He loves to challenge our identity after we've sinned. That's when he comes. He's the accuser of the brother. Or when we're dealing with doubt. We're not sure where to go, how to go forward. We're not sure what to do. We're not sure how to behave. Then he'll come and challenge your identity. Don't get mad at me. But we've had our identity challenged by COVID. 
teaching. And I'm not ashamed to say this. We've been marked more by fear than we have by faith in the church. We've abandoned our character. Now, that doesn't mean we live risky. Somebody say amen. Or unwise, because we could look at this, and the devil tells him to throw himself down off the temple. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to. So what you do is you find out, it's simple as this, you find out what God wants you to do, and that's what you do. And since you're going to stand before your maker or fall before him, then you'll be accountable for your choices and decisions. So you can't allow a culture, a community, or anybody else to force your decisions. Whether it's pro or con on something. God tells you to take the vaccine, take it. He tells you not to take it, don't take it. Make it a simple matter of obedience. Remove the fear and insert the trust. But if you don't know him intimately and you're getting false prophetic voices, you've had false teaching, and you're influenced by a another gospel, another Christ, then, then it, the fog becomes so thick that it's hard to have any perception. I mean, if something cuts through it, prayer of repentance. Somebody said, God, I don't know what to do. I'm sorry for the things I've done that I did not get your approval for. I'm stopping right here, and now I'm ready to be redirected. Forgive me for, for being, listen, it's hard to hear. I'm almost trying to get done. I'm looking for an exit ramp. <laughs> this is hard for me to hear, so I imagine it may be hard for you to hear. Apathy is an act of rebellion. We think if it's not aggressive, we think it's not rebellion. We also think if we don't ask, we haven't rebelled. I don't want to get into psychology, but everybody knows what passive aggression is. And that's what we get involved with. So the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Listen, hear me. Do not let the culture, do not let the saved or the saved, do not let anyone make you perform on demand. That's what Jesus is, because they get in control. Jesus recognized it. Because, see, Satan comes at him and he says, I'm going to attack his identity. I'm going to attack his pride. That's what he's attacking, his pride. And, I, and he's saying to him, I want you to prove you're who you are. And then the unspoken implication is that Satan will then, and later on he reveals it, uh, Satan will reward him. But what Jesus recognizes is that Satan is trying to get Jesus, trying to get him to perform and obey him in order to get his what? Approval. But here's Jesus' answer, and we'll close with this. Verse 4, but he answered, it is written. So what does he do? He knows how to behave because he knows the scripture. He knows what's been said. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, if you just stop there, that leaves a lot of open, doesn't it? Simply what Jesus is saying is, man can't live on what he already has. Right? Man can't live on what physically can be produced. And then he finishes that, but every, say that with me, every, one more time so I know you're awake, and every word, not some not part-time, not when you want it, not when you think you need it, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's just do a little offshoot note right here. And so if Jesus is depending on the word that comes out of the mouth of God, by the way, what word do you think he's talking about? Has the New Testament been written yet? No. He's living by the Old Testament. Living by Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and all the other things that are that are placed in there. And so what did, what does he say? Out of the mouth of God. And here's the little segue note that if we had a, my little Bible, I'd put a note out here. 
This is precisely why false prophets arise in order to crowd out the voice of God in your head. And let me tell you, just throw this in my little note in my Bible on the side I would write. <clears throat> Not only that, but we seek prophets who tell us what we want to hear that will enable and predict the things we want in the future, not necessarily the things of God. Listen, you and I do it all the time. You get in an argument, one of the first things you do is you look for somebody to validate your position. By the way, that's a dangerous way to study the Bible. It'll get you in trouble. If you're studying the Bible and, and you go to outside sources, you, look, you see where the spirits arrived you at. And if you look at, don't, don't just read people who agree with you. Right? For two reasons. Number one, it may expose an error in your thinking or cause you, for me, what it usually do is my position is pretty solid, but uh, I can't. I can't, the, the, I can't show the work. When I took algebra, uh, I could get the answer, but I could never show the work. That means I guess pretty good. <laughs> I just told the teacher I was an intuitive thinker. <laughs> she says, well, I'll give you an intuitive grade. <laughs> and her intuition and mine were not the same. But, but, but what, often, what often has to happen for us, we become lazy, and we know the right answer, but we don't know why it's the right answer. Okay? And so we need to know why it's the right answer. And it's okay to start with, because God said so. But God also wants you to know why he said so. And I will tell you what you're doing is you're trying to make the connection between what he said and his love. And you're trying to find out how what he said expresses his love for you. That's how you, that's how you should study the word of God. Even a rebuke and a correction. He rebukes and corrects us because he loves us. Okay? And so somewhere, we know the starting point's love, and we know what the ending point is, but the loving takes place in the in, in the in-between. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, I've gone 12 minutes over, and um, I know you guys are curious about what's going to happen to the chiefs. Not so much from me. Okay, so we'll come back, and we'll pick it up next time about one of the ways to get to live, to get the character of Christ developing is, is to let the Spirit lead you and you will live a life the way Jesus lived it. By the way, it's contrary to our culture. It's something I still struggle with. By the way, do you know Jesus had no security issues? He didn't. He didn't worry about where his house was. He didn't worry about what he was going to eat. Didn't worry about what he was going to drink. Didn't worry about what he was going to wear. I did all three of those this morning. I got some work to do. Father, we ask you to help us as we process this on the individual level, Lord, Father. We're trusting the Holy Spirit will definitely screen out things that don't need to remain. And as you sift it, only the truth will remain for us. We ask, Lord, that you, you open our hearts and our minds. And that more than anything else, you give us the want to, the genuine desire, the craving, the longing to be with you. Help us, teach us to love you as you love us. And that we would follow closely. No price would be too high. No pain too severe. No joy too exuberant to deter us from following you. We ask this in Jesus' name that everyone said, Amen. If you have any prayer or needs, I'll remain around the front and anoint you with oil. Uh, Father, what did I forget? Oh, pray for her. Okay. All right. Greet one another. Share.